I'm so glad to be back with you all today after um, about two weeks of vacation, and um, I'm glad to be um, preaching again and sharing with you today. For those who don't know me, my name is Louis Skippers, and um, I'm the senior pastor at Grace Church, and we are in a summer series called Words to the Wise, in which we are looking at different scriptures throughout the book of Proverbs, written by Solomon, the wisest man to have ever lived, the Bible says. And the book of Proverbs is full of really deep spiritual insights, and we've talked about a lot of them already over the last couple of weeks. But the book of Proverbs is also a book that talks about really practical things in life. And here is why. The Christian life, the walk with God, is not just a spiritual exercise that affects my Sundays when I'm in the building, in the church building. It doesn't affect just my 30 minutes maybe of devotional time that I have or the hour and a half a week that I'm with my small group. The walk with God affects every single part of our lives. It affects the way that we have relationships with other people. It affects the way that we um, work. It affects the way that we parent. It affects the way we use our money. It affects every single area of our life. And therefore today, we're going to be talking about a super practical thing that affects all of our lives. And I want to start with a story, and you'll probably figure out what our topic is today as I'm going through the story. But years ago, 1839 to 1937, a man lived named John D. Rockefeller. He was the founder of the Standard Oil Company in the U.S. And at the peak of his wealth, hear this, he was worth about 1% of the entire U.S. economy, 1%. They say even today, like even Elon Musk, they have done some inflation, and they say that what, 340 billion strong or something could get about where, where Rockefeller was. But this guy was the first billionaire in the USA. Like so much money that I think most of us don't even have an idea of how we would ever spend something like this. But then a reporter one day asked him, and they said, the reporter said, how much money is enough? Okay, this guy is worth 1% of the entire U.S. economy. And he said, his answer, how much money is enough? His reply was, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. And I think we, we all, when you hear that, we all know that there's something wrong with that statement, right? When you are worth billions of dollars and you're like, I just need a, a little bit more, a couple more dollars, and then I'll be good. We all feel there's something wrong with that statement. Here's the irony to that. We all live exactly that same way. We all just need a little bit more money for retirement, We all just need a little bit more money for my kids' schooling and studies. We all just need a little bit more to afford the car that actually doesn't have rust spots on it. We all just need a little bit more before we will start giving or before we will start being generous. All of us live with the same notion all the time. And it's interesting when it comes to money, Throughout the Bible, both in the Old Testament, the Bible talks about money. Then when Jesus came to earth, Jesus talked about it quite a lot. And then the rest of the writers of the New Testament also talks about money quite frequently. And the question is why? Because Jesus said money has the biggest potential to become the main competitor for the throne of our hearts. Money has a way to push God off of the throne of our hearts and take that place. And therefore today, in line with this series, um, Words to, to Make You Wise, our topic today is a better way to view money. And we're going to be talking about our general view of the purpose of money in our lives, a better way to view money. And we're going to be reading today from Proverbs 11. And in Proverbs 11, the whole chapter is basically this comparison of wise people and foolish people and how they, 
how they look at life, what they do with their lives. These wise people, Solomon says, they do it a certain way. And then these foolish people, or often also called evil people, that do it a different way. And constantly is comparing the two. So what we're going to do is, out of Proverbs 11, we're just going to read three sections that specifically, and he talks about a whole bunch of life things here. But we're going to read three sections that specifically talk about money. So you can read from the screen, Proverbs 11, or if you've got your Bibles with you, you can open. I am reading today from the New Living Translation. And this is what Solomon writes. Proverbs 11, verse 4. Riches won't help on the day of judgment, but right living can save you from death. The godly are directed by honesty, but the wicked fall beneath their load of sin. The godliness of good people rescues them, and the ambition of treacherous people traps them. And then we skip to verse 18, where it continues talking about money. Evil people get rich for the moment, but the reward of the godly will last. Godly people find life, evil people find death. And then we skip to verse 24 to 26. Give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper. Those who refreshes others will themselves be refreshed. People curse those who hoard their grain, but they bless the one who sells in time of need. That's all we're going to read today. It is so interesting to me when we read this. To take it from who it comes Solomon wasn't a guy who, who was figuring out, like, if he's wealthy or not wealthy. He, he wasn't like us. Like, none of us probably in this room believe that we are wealthy, right? But compared to the world standard, we are in the top couple of percentages. And Solomon didn't try to figure that out. He knew he was wealthy. Because Solomon, God asked him, Solomon, ask me anything in the world and I will give it to you. And Solomon didn't ask for wealth. Solomon didn't ask for power. Solomon didn't ask for peace. He asked for wisdom. He said, God, give me wisdom to rule your people well. And God said he was so wise already in that request that God gave him everything else as well. So King David, his father, was the one who united Israel, who drove all of the other nations away, was in constant war and expanded this kingdom of Israel. So by the time that King Solomon took over, it was a time of peace. And we read in the Bible that he became really wealthy and that the nation truly prospered. So what he has to say about money comes from someone who has a view of money, who says, I've achieved a lot, and looking back at my life, when I have to give advice to my children, advice that will make them wise, here is what I would say. And I want to look at these three sections. Each one, I believe, has a very specific truth attached to it. So these three simple points today. And the first part, we read from verse 4 to 6. Where basically what Solomon is trying to teach his children and those who read this book is that money has very limited power. Because here what he says in verse 4 to 6, he says, riches don't help you when you're on your deathbed. He says, honest people or, or the, the wise people are directed by honesty and the evil people fall under the load of the sin. Godliness leads to people being rescued. Ambition leads to people being trapped. Now, when you read this or when you read other passages in the Bible that talks about money, there's often a competition in the church. Some people who believe that God just wants us to have a lot of money and some people that believe you need to have nothing. The question is when we read this, does God have something against money or not? And the answer is quite simply no. No. Money is just a way to trade stuff, to put food on the table, to take one thing and get another thing for it. God does not have a problem with money, but God does have a problem when we put all of our trust in money. It's ironic that on the U.S. bill it says trust in God, right? But it's on a bill. But we all do it. We all put our trust in money. Think about it for a moment. You might be like, Louis, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not like that. I'm not super materialistic. Don't we rely on money to take care of us 
once we retire. That's why we save very heavily into pension funds, right? Do we not rely on money to take care of us when we're sick? Our money affords us certain medical care. And in, I know in Canada, we are kind of more limited when you're sick to whatever the government offers us. It's not like the U.S. or South Africa where if you have more money, you can buy better health care, right? But in, uh, even a lot of Canadians will cross a border to buy better health care we, because we trust in money to take care of us in our sickness. We trust in money to provide security to our lives. And here's the reality about money. Money does have value, and money does have power attached to it. But what Solomon is saying is it has limited power. It runs out quickly. I have never in my life seen a U-Haul truck at a graveside. You cannot take your money, you cannot take your stuff with you. And what Solomon is trying to teach us is that we can trust in money and hope that it will have the power to do for us what we think we cannot do for ourselves. But money's power is limited. And at some point, it's going to run out on you. And that might be on your sickbed, or that might be the day that you close your eyes and you die. But it has limited power. And therefore, he says, it's not really worth to invest everything into it. Jesus spoke about it. In Luke 12, verse 13 to 21, this brother comes to Jesus and he says, listen, Jesus, my brother doesn't want to share our inheritance properly. And Jesus is like, one, I'm not your judge. But two, he tells them a parable, a story with a meaning. And Jesus tells him about this businessman that put his trust in money. He had a great harvest. So he thought, whoa, I'm going to tear down my bonds and I'm going to big." I'm going to build big storehouses, and I'm going to store all of this stuff, and I'm going to retire comfortably. I have my money that I've put my trust in that will take care of me till the day I die. And then he says, and then God answered him, you fool, on this very night, you will die. He put his trust in physical things. But it's power, although it does have power, we see the world revolving often around money and power, right? It is limited power. And therefore, in verse 5, Solomon says that we have a choice when it comes to life, when it comes to the way that we look at our money, to either do things that is right in our own eyes, or to do things what is to use it in a way that is right in the eyes of God. He says we can use money either in honesty or we can use it to feed our sin. Now, this might seem a little bit confusing, but in the next verse, in verse 6, um, the, the New Living Translation says that the ambition of treacherous people traps them. Now, some of the translations use different words there that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but the actual Hebrew word that we translate in the New Living as ambition actually means greed. Greed. See, there is this contrast when he, that he talks about in verse 5 and verse 6. Another way to translate it is as lust. And he says we can lust for power and we can lust for whatever we, we have. And then we can use money to feed that sin, that lust to be in control of our lives, that lust, that need to, to make sure that I, I have security in life. And he says we can use money to feed that sin, the sin of pride, the sin of greed, whatever it might be. But he says it leads down a path. And what is the path? It will trap you. It will take you captive and it will keep you in a place where you worship something, where you trust in something that doesn't have the ability to do what you think it can do for you. He says, or you can use money in an honest way, and guess what path that will lead you down? He says, um, the gener uh, sorry, verse 6, the godliness of good people rescues them. When we use our money in an honest way, when we use it the way God wants us to use it, it rescues us. Because now we don't put our trust in money, we use it in a godly way. So our trust is in God, and it leads to a place of rescue, not a place where money entraps us, but a place where it serves a purpose that is in according 
obedience to God in accordance with God's will for our lives. So this is the first thing I want you to get. Money has limited power, and it cannot give you what is most important in your life. It cannot save you. To a certain extent, it can help with your healing, but it cannot fully heal you. It cannot fix your relationships, even though you can pay for 60 different counselors. It cannot save you from your addiction. The power that money has is limited, and it cannot give you what is most important in your life. Only God can. But then he continues in verse 18 to 19, and he, he basically It's very similar, but he switches gears a little bit. Not only does money have limited power, but he talks about the temporary nature of money. And he says, evil people get rich for a moment, but godliness gives rewards that last. Because the people in this room and the people watching online, we are all different generations, different ages. But the one thing that I've never heard anyone say, no matter how old they are, is like, oh man, my life is so long. So long. I wish it will just like go by a little quicker. Paul talks about it. He says, all of these things that we face in life is gone, but in a moment. And guess what? Even riches can be gone in a moment. It doesn't last. And money cannot satisfy, satisfy the most eternal cravings in our hearts. You see, we often use money as a drug. And what is the problem with the drug? A drug gives us a temporary high, right? Where I forget about my problems, where I forget about the things that bother me, where for a moment I feel happy about something. And that is the problem with money, is that we use it as a drug for a temporary high. It's interesting that you all know during COVID how online shopping skyrocketed, right? They had to, all the tech companies have employed thousands and thousands of people that they now all had to fire. But it wasn't just because you were locked in your house that you had to do online shopping. There's been so much research done that during times of uncertainty, people use online shopping as a coping mechanism. Back in the day, you did window shopping. You walked through a mall and you looked at the stuff in the window that you couldn't afford. Now there's ways to get stuff that you can't afford. We use it as a drug. This is what they say. When we buy stuff online, it releases dopamines in our brain. So we feel good. And they say the high leads to compulsive shopping. I don't even need stuff. I keep buying stuff that I don't need. It leads to compulsive shopping. And hear this. As a coping mechanism to hide emotions like stress, anxiety, and low self-esteem. And then not being able to control your shopping leads to feelings of shame and guilt. It is a spiral that leads deeper and deeper. And therefore, in Proverbs 15, Solomon, this wealthy guy, writes this. He says, better to have little with fear of the Lord than to have great treasure and inner turmoil. It's so interesting to me that the wealthiest people in the world are not the happiest people. Your inner turmoil, the deepest desires of your heart to find happiness, to find love, to know your creator. That can never be solved by money because money's power is not only limited, but it's temporary. Therefore, Solomon says, don't trust in that. And again, he uses these contrasting outcomes in verse 19, where he says, godly people, people who trust in God first instead of in money, what happens? They find life. But evil people, the people that he said gets rich only for a moment, what do they find? He says they find death. That's what Jesus said as well in Matthew 16, verse 19 to 20. You probably know this if you grew up in church, where Jesus said, don't store up treasures on earth where moth, and vermin, and thieves destroy it, but store up treasure in heaven. So don't give your life, don't give everything you have to stuff that is temporary. What Jesus was saying, what Solomon is trying to teach his children is, give your life to something that has no end, to something that is eternal. Money is temporary. Material things are temporary. They're here today, they're gone tomorrow. So place your focus on what never runs out. Place your focus on God and not on money. 
Because money can be a God. Money can be a drug for a, t- for a temporary high. But he says that leads down a bad and hard path, and you will be trapped. So don't invest your life into that. Take it for what it is. Take it for the blessing that God is supplying you with. But at the end of the day, put your focus on what never runs out, and that is the grace, and that is the love of a God that has bigger plans for you than money can ever have for you. Money has no plan for you. Nothing. It's just a way to trade. So, if money has limited power and it's only temporary, the question is, why does God still bless us with money? And I think there's two simple answers. One is he blesses us with money so that we have food on our table. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, one of the main lines in that prayer was what? Give us today our daily bread. It's only the wealthiest people in the world who would say money doesn't matter. A poor person would tell you it matters well. It matters a lot when they don't have food on the table. So God supplies in our needs. He gives us money so that we can put bread on the table, right? But most of us, we have way more than what we need to put bread on the table. So why then does God bless us beyond that? And I believe God blesses us, the Bible says, so that we can be a blessing. Money has a blessing potential. And that is what verse 24 to 26 talks about. Hear how it's what Solomon says in those couple of verses, give freely and receive more. I was like, that doesn't make sense, right? When you give away, you don't receive. He says, generous people will prosper and be refreshed and they will be blessed. There's this old song, an old saying that was then made into a song. You get what you give. Okay, five people got that. Clearly no one lived in the 90s. In 1998, The new radicals had a song called, You Get What You Give. Like, how do you not know that song? It's like classic soft rock. Come on. Um, It was a a great song. But there's this old saying, you get what you give. And spiritually, what Solomon is trying to teach his son is that God rewards those who recognize one God's ownership of everything. Not my own ownership, but God's ownership of everything in my life. And commit to using whatever God gives us in a way that will bring honor to him. Solomon talked about honesty. Talked about right living. And Jesus said a very similar thing. In Luke 6 verse 38, Jesus said, give and you will receive. What you give determines what you get back. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 to 7, Paul actually reflects on Proverbs 11, verse 24, on, this verse, on these verses, when he says, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And then hear this, God loves a cheerful giver. Then in Proverbs 19, Solomon writes this. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible, just like practical-wise. If you help the poor, you are lending to the Lord, and he will repay you. Have you ever thought of that? When you're helping someone in need, and you're like, oh, no, I'm never going to see this. God's like, no, don't worry. I'll take care of it. And it's not always in physical, material blessing. But God is like, I will take care of you. See, and this is not about just going home and finding stuff to give away. What did Paul say? It's about a generous heart. It's about an attitude that is different. We might hope and my trust and everything in life is not in my money because then I'm greedy and I'm stingy and I don't want to let it go. He says at the end of this, in what is it, verse 26, it's like someone in a time of crisis that doesn't want to sell his wheat and when he does, he sells it at an inflated price because he's greedy. He says like that's not what God wants of us. That's not why God blesses us. He wants us to have a different attitude, the attitude of the Father, an attitude of generosity. That went so far to the point where Jesus even gave his life for us on a cross. And I believe this can make such a big difference in the world and Maybe you're like, Louis, what, what does this mean to me? If you're a business person or you're a boss or you're in HR, I want to tell you, I think that this teaches us to be generous to our employees. 
And it's interesting, research has shown that businesses who are generous to their employees set themselves up for success because one, their employees appreciate their generosity and consequently they found that productivity then increases when they're well paid. Two, they are inclined to stay longer. They don't look for other jobs because they're happy and they provide the business with experience and knowledge that was gained over a long period of time. Customers react positively to businesses that are generous. I'm like, this is all studies in the business world. I'm like, as the church, we should be known as the most generous people in the world. Businesses shouldn't, shouldn't take us out on, on that one. We should be the most generous people. That's why I'm like, we might not have a cappuccino machine here, but coffee will always be free here. We're never selling it. And I'm fine with churches who want to do that. But I want to be known for our generosity. That's why our summer break camp costs almost nothing. Why our tickets at a fun fair is like 50 cents or something. Because we want to be known as people who are generous, not people who are in this life to profit from it, not people who are greedy. And I think all of us can learn how to give more generously to God's work, who can give more generously to those in need. Because generosity speaks of a God that is so different to this world. So different. This summer we, we watched um, the Chosen series. I don't know if you've watched it. It's a great series. And um, if you haven't watched it, go and, go and see it. It's about the life of Jesus. There's three seasons now. Last ni- uh, two nights ago, we finished the last episode of season three, where Jesus multiplies the bread and the fish to the thousands of people. Five loaves and two fish. And it was so cool to just see it, because you always have this mind picture, and it's cool to actually see it on a screen. And it's, of course, not exactly what happened, because we, we have limited info, right? We have to to um, be creative with it, but what was so beautiful to me is that a boy with five loaves and two fish, it's all he had, could stand before Jesus and say, this is what I have to offer. He didn't wait till he had enough bread to feed the 5,000 or enough feed fish to take care of all of the children. He came with his five loaves and his two fish and he gave it to Jesus rather than holding back. And I, I believe that God does not need much to do great things. God actually needs nothing from us. He can take care of himself. He's Lord over everything. But he wants us to bring to him. He expects us to make available to him all that we have. That is what I believe Solomon is trying to teach his children is that money The beauty of money is that it has a blessing potential. It has the potential to be a blessing to everyone around us. And God doesn't need much from you to do great things. I'm not here today to recruit money, to get money for our church or to tell you how much you should give. I believe that the tithe is a principle in the Bible, but this is not what it's about. I want you today to think about how you can get free from the trust that we put in money and to see how God wants you to have the same heart that he had, a heart of generosity. And he doesn't need much to do great things but he expects you to make available what you do have. And when we can give to him what we do have, it sets us free from the trust that we have in money, the power that we believe it has. It sets us free from the trust that we have, that we believe money will take care of our deepest heart's desire. When we give, it cures our greed. It cures those ambition that lust for more. And it helps us to live a life that looks more like Jesus than a life that looks like the world. I want to close with Proverbs 23, two verses. It's not on the screen. I want you to just listen for a moment. I don't know where you are at your, in your walk of life, how you're thinking about the next promotion or about the salary you want or whatever it might be. But I want to read from Proverbs 23, verse 4. Just, just take this in. Solomon says, don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to know when to quit. Because in the blink of an eye, wealth disappears. For it sprouts wings and fly away like an eagle. 
Don't wear yourself out on something that's temporary. I want to give my life to something that means more. Something that's eternal. The only eternal one in this world is our God. Let's pray. Father, thank you. That there is no one in this world who has a more generous spirit than you. I can't even imagine what it took when you decided to send your son Jesus to down a cross in our place for our sin, for our brokenness. So that we could receive healing, so that we can, could receive rescue, so that we could receive freedom. God, you're so good to us. I want to thank you today for every blessing, the blessing of Jesus but also the physical blessings we experience every day in life, the the paycheck we receive, the food on our tables, the cars we get to drive, the the houses we can live in. I want to thank you, God, that you supply above and beyond what we need. I pray, God, that we would not put our trust in something that's actually powerless, that we would not put our trust in something that's temporary, But our our trust would always be fully in Jesus, the creator and the sustainer of all things. I pray, God, that our hearts would be more like you every day. And that as a church, that we would be known as generous people, not for our sakes, so that the world can see something of our generous God in the way we live. We pray it in Jesus' name.